program was recorded at ARC Advisory Group's annual World Industry Forum in Orlando, Florida. I'm pleased to welcome Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, Russell Goodman. Hello. Electrical Power Systems Life Cycle Management. We want to explore that topic today with Craig Resnick, Research Director at ARC Advisory Group. Craig, welcome. Hmm, thanks to be here, Russell. Greg, ARC recently conducted a survey looking into electrical products, life cycle management of same. What was that all about? What were the driving forces that prompted you to do a survey? Well, what happened is we were getting a lot of inquiries from our major processing customers. And they were asking us about the fact that when is it time to actually start to replace a lot of the legacy equipment that they've been, that's been running on the factory floor. You know, certainly in this past recession, uh, capital expenditure money is very scarce. And in many cases, things that need to be replaced have been put off. And even now that the recovery is in, in process, capital expenditure money has not come back to the point that, uh, you know, to it had been traditionally. So now what's happening is, as customers are trying to determine when is the optimum time to replace a lot of the older legacy equipment on the factory floor. They don't want to replace it too soon, nor do they want to uh, re replace it when it's too late, because when it's too late, it usually results in a production failure. And uh, that is obviously an unacceptable position uh, from a, for productivity and uh, profitability for the plant. What did the survey determine, though, in terms of uh, people's expectations of an operable life cycle for these systems and components? Well, what happened was is we certainly noticed a, a great disparity between uh, life cycles. Uh, for example, we go to these plants and these people have transformers that were running 40 to 50 years and still running continuously. And they're still doing things like checking oil and IR scans to keep these transformers going. There's switch gear, there's motor control centers that are running, say, 20 to 30 years. Uh, again, same thing of trying to maintain and, and, and monitor these systems to keep them running as long as they can. Uh, motors and drives in a 10 to 20 year period. So we're seeing uh, certainly different products having different life cycle expectations. But nevertheless, people are trying to make sure how do we optimize the length of the, of the asset. Well, quite aside from whatever the expectation might have been, what, what did you find was the average uh, age of these systems, or did it just vary from uh, one device to another? If you probably did an aggregate number, uh, probably range between, let's say, 15 to 25 years. Uh, between, you know, again, with, with things, products such as transformers on the upper end in that 40-year range, maybe some products like some drives down at the 10-year at the range, so probably in about a 15 to 25 year aggregate. Um, you know, and, and that's looking at mainly a lot of the heavier process industries, certainly oil and gas, uh, chemical industry, mining and metals. Was it common to find that whatever the age was, it was quite often something that extended beyond the manufacturer's stated date of obsolescence? Oh, absolutely. Because well, what would happen is a lot of times the manufacturer's obsolescence date was based on the fact that maybe they've discontinued the product and maybe they've discontinued support for the product. And many times that date though is, I don't want to say the manufacturers ignore that date, but they look to third party sources. They're actually looking at eBay to see if they can purchase some of these products you know, in third party to, su to support it and extend the life cycle. So in many cases, they're not really worried about if the manufacturer says this product is obsolete, they're making the determination whether the product is obsolete or not, rather than leaving it to what the manufacturer is telling them. Now, presumably you asked, uh people if they had a life cycle management policy in effect, what did they tell you? <laughs> Believe it or not, in many cases it was, uh, 
It was on a plant-to-plant -plant basis. There was no consistent policy. Uh, many times it may have been determined by what the plant manager says. Maybe it would have been the, the head of operations. Uh, but it may, there was never a consistent, you know, ISO type of policy, you know, plant by plant that says here is how you manage life cycle expectation. The only common denominator that we found is that the, 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 the people are told you can have capital expenditure money to prevent a failure, but you cannot buy it too soon and replace it too soon, but nor can you wait until it's too late. And that's the, that's the cat chasing its tail. You never really know when is the product of going to fail, but at the same time, you don't want to replace it if there is still some life left in the asset. When problems did occur, that would trigger, presumably, an upgrade or a replacement. What kind of factors did trigger that? The fear of lost production and is, is the number one by far factor in why somebody is going to think about uh, going through upgrading some of this equipment that is old but continue but still running for the for the moment uh, at, at a healthy at a healthy rate. So what they're doing is they're looking at opportunities to say if this product fails, okay, what's the lead time to replace these products? You know, this could be a transformer that was custom designed, for example, for this plant, and now all of a sudden the lead time might be three months. So therefore, what they're doing is they're looking at product lead time as a as to sense, you know something, uh, we need to hedge our bets here and we need to be making some proactive investments to prevent disaster because can you imagine if a production plant was out of uh, offline for three months, you know, you would completely blow away all profitability, maybe of several years worth of profitability, just to save the cost of maybe possibly purchasing a product like a transformer too early. Did you find that when they, once they were considering an upgrade, that they in fact engaged in some type of, of systematic assessment of the condition of the systems or equipment that they had? Well, um, what they would do is, if you're going to go through the process of going through an upgrade, it usually revolves a, a certain amount of planned shutdown time. Now, if you're going to go through the process of shutting the plant down for a day or a week or several weeks to do this, you're going to go through the, the, the exercise of checking everything out because it is difficult to take time out of production for a shutdown for maintenance or preventative maintenance or what have you. So the idea is, is let's go through the whole process and say if we're going to start to replace these tr the transformers, for example, let's look at switch gear, let's look at motor control centers, let's look at motors, let's look at drives, let's look at anything that now, if we're going to if we're going to make, take the step to do the upgrade, let's upgrade everything we can and take advantage of the shutdown time. Now, I would, uh, would imagine that a major decision would be, do we do a replacement on a, a migration on a wholesale basis, just jump right in with both feet, or do we do this in phases, in stages? What did the survey find? The survey found is that everybody wants to do it in phases. Uh, for several reasons. First of all is they want to make sure that they're doing it at a pace that's manageable. Uh, secondly, they're thinking in terms of, of, of CapEx money, that the fact is now you're doing a piece at a time rather than having to write a very, very large check. So everybody's looking at this as something that they can do in a phased approach rather than in an overall, you know, all at once approach. Conclusions, recommendations, now that you've had an opportunity to look at the, uh, the survey, study the results, study what the, uh, the folks said, what would you tell uh, folks? First of all, we think that people should be doing the condition assessment as far ahead of time as possible because there's no reason why you can't be closely monitoring these devices because you're, you're, you're not, that's the only way you're going to be able to come close to predicting failure. And, and be in a position where you can start getting the orders out to the suppliers with the appropriate lead time to get the product in time to prevent any sort of a shutdown. So we really can't emphasize enough that we recognize you're not gonna ever have an unlimited capital expenditure budget, but make sure that you're on top of the situation so you can, you can catch failure at its earliest, uh, earliest point and prevent any sort of a shutdown. Sounds like you can't start too soon. You cannot start too soon, very good point. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. A pleasure to meet you. Craig Resnick, 
ARC Advisory Group and speaking with us today about electrical power systems life cycle management. Thank you for watching.